praise the Lord. That's called, Have You Any Room for Jesus? That's a nice little song that we sing around Christmas time, but it's good for all times of the year. And you know uh, the story when uh, uh, Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem and there was just no room for Jesus at the inn. Well, you know, today a lot of things are going on in this life. And it just seems like people don't have any time for Jesus. They've got time for everything. Time for everything under the sun. Take their children to the soccer game or to a baseball game or take them here or there or watch a little more TV, watch this, do that. But we need to have, spend a little more time and allow Jesus to come into our life. It's the only way we're going to have peace, you know, is to have the Prince of Peace living in your life. Praise the Lord. Glory, glory, hallelujah. This is the story of my growing up, and uh, if anybody's interested in uh, obtaining one of these books, you can through any bookstore. This is from Tate Publishing, and uh, I would like to just read, before we get into the scripture, I want to read a little bit about one of the stories from the book, and this is a story of when I was a, just a kid, and uh, we were living in a tent over on... Uh, over in uh, Maryland, 
um, the state of Maryland, and we were living on a road, at the Y in the road, we had a tent set up, and we were living in this tent. And uh, I wanna just read a little bit here. One day we had no food except a bottle of ketchup someone had given us. Mom heated the water on the fireplace and poured the bottle of ketchup. It was late in the day, near dusk. She poured a little of the soup into our bowls and we enjoyed the meal when I noticed around the edge of the bowl little spots scattered like pepper. I thought we had no seasoning, so I commented on having pepper in the soup. My father stood and came closer to the fire to examine his bowl of soup. Looking at it, he dashed the soup to the ground and turned to us and said, that's not pepper, that's gnats from the fire. Quick, throw it out. Sure enough, swarming over the fire was about a million gnats. I kept right on eating and told my father if he didn't want to eat, that was his business. As for me, I wanted to eat, and I went back for more. Normally, I wouldn't have eat, eaten that way. But when you're hungry, you eat things that you would not eat. So that's a little story in the book. And that will open up our story this morning, uh, uh, talking uh, this morning about America. And on a daily basis in America, the Christian faith and the God and the Bible are subject to disdain, contempt, and open hostility by those who, determine, who are determined to eradicate Christianity in America. The number of outrageous attacks are increasing in magnitude, and it looks like there's no end to this hostility. Let's, let me just uh, list a few, a few. At Liberty Elementary School in Keller, Texas, they removed the phrase, in God we trust, from the yearbook to not offend other religious beliefs. In another instance, in Fredericksburg, Virginia, the city council voted to ban any reference to Jesus Christ in prayers after being threatened by the ACLU if the practice continued. Now the U.S. Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal had already unanimously ruled that opening its meetings with a prayer that mentions Jesus Christ, the great, uh, uh, the great Falls uh, uh, South Carolina Town Council was guilty of unconstitutional advancement of one religion, meaning the Christian religion. So over and over again, they are trying to remove Jesus Christ out of the systems in America. Time and again, we find America are shutting the door to Christ and his Father. In Psalm 33, in verse 12, it said, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now you remember uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare, who was an active atheist, took the public school systems to court back in 1963 and won a Supreme Court decision ending official Bible reading in American public schools. That was in 1963. I remember as a child... We always had a Bible reading in the school. But it was after 1963, since that time, it was illegal to read the Bible in school. Since then, the unsaved world has been systematically tearing the Lord from their records. And there is no doubt about these things as they're happening in America. And that opens us to the particular scripture that I had pointed out and we are going to be reading from Matthew 12 and 43. And as we get into this, there's a couple of phases of this little story that I want to present. Uh, and so let me read this, and then we'll go from there. Uh, Matthew 12 and 43, when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, and seeketh rest, and findeth none. Then he said, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Uh, then he goeth, and he taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and he enters in and dwells there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it 
be also unto this wicked generation. And I want to emphasize the last part of that. Even so, shall it be also with this wicked generation. Now what Jesus is telling us in the story is, is that when you take out one thing, it is replaced with something else. We have found this in the Middle East to be so. We have perfect picture of this. Uh, when we knocked Saddam Hussein out, took him out of there, and look what happened. We did not replace him with a responsible replacement. But what we did is we opened the door. We threw him out and we opened the door. Now we have ISIS, we have all these other little groups come in. And what did they do? One and a half million Christians were living in that area. Now it's down to just a few hundred. What happened? They had to, they had to leave, they had to exit because you had taken something out. Now ISIS came in and they were killing the Christians, wholesale killing of all Christians in that uh, uh, particular area. In the scriptures, the Lord said that when the demon is cast out, the room is swept clean. You, you, you clean it out. Now I wanna, uh, I'm going to make reference here of our situation in America. I'm going to turn the tables a little bit. Instead of the demon being cast out, here we have uh, Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Christian church cast out. You, you have cast him out of America. You've taken out the one thing that we find in America, the only thing in the whole world, where we could say, who is the Prince of Peace? It isn't it Jesus Christ? He is the Prince of Peace. So when you take the Prince of Peace out of your life, out of your country, out of your schools, out of your nation, out of your assemblies, what have you done? You have opened a big vacuum. You've opened something up where something else is going to come in. It cannot remain neutral. It cannot remain an empty place. It will never remain an empty place. I remember when I was a young fellow and I used to go fishing. And I would go up uh, to the lake and I would catch a fish. And then they would tell me, that's a big fish you caught. And the, the fish would live in that one area, a big fish, you know, and they would, they would uh, eat the little fish in that area. And when you take one big fish out, another big fish comes in and takes over. And it takes over the area. You think, well, I cleaned that out. I took the fish out of there. There'll be another big one that'll take over that area. Same thing in our... In the wilderness, you have a spot where there's a, 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 her, a, a herd of deer or a, a, a bunch of wolves or something, and they'll mark their territory, they'll live in that area. You clean them out, guess what? Something else is going to come in there, unless you put something there. And I, what am I trying to tell you? I'm telling you that in this case, the, when we replace something, we have got to have something that's going to fill in. America is evicting God from the schools, from the, from the courts, and from everything that it can. it can. It wants to get God out. And have you noticed that there is beginning to be a pattern to the replacement? Something is replacing peace. What is it? It's a conflict. It's a, it's a threat of, of horrific terror. Terrible things are happening in America. I, I, I don't say this jokingly, but when I look around and I see how our legislators and our congressmen and our presidents and different people, you know, and they, they try to make laws. They say, well, oh, this terrible thing happened. We'll make a law, and this law will correct that, that error. You can make laws all day long, and you'll make one law on top of the other, and that's what they've been doing. They, oh, this law is now, now we're going to make another law to correct that law to make that law and all of this is because of the pride in their hearts they have evicted God from their lives and they will not take him back oftentimes we read how the uh, the uh, uh, Israelites of the of uh, uh, days gone by that they would uh, they were put into uh, their land by Moses remember God they had Moses to deliver them into the land and they finally come into the land and for a little while they would be doing good, you know, and then they would forsake the Lord. They would begin to serve uh, other gods and, and then the enemy would come in and, 
and uh, bring them into slavery and they would go in for a little while and then they'd cry out to God, oh God, help us. And God, being a loving God that he is, he come and he brought them back into the land and gave them their land and, and, and blessed them and, and let them uh, uh, prosper for a while. And then they would begin to do this all over again. And we see a process of any time that you take God out of your life, it is going to be replaced with something else. It, 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 there's no such thing as saying, well, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, I, I, I hear some people say, well, you know, I don't believe in God, but that don't mean that I can't have good morals. Where do you get your morals from? Who Do you uh, base your morals on what you think your morals ought to be? Wow. If you do and you think that's all right, then you've got to be, you've got to say it's okay for the next guy and his morals and what he figures his morals should be. So if his morals, if his morals don't line up with yours, what are you going to do? What is replacing the Lord? Killing and mayhem. America says we will make laws to protect ourselves. In 1963, the court agreed with O'Hare and threw the Bible out of the schools. They opened the door to Satan. And little by little, the devil has gained a foothold on our youth. The battle is raging in every corner in America. Recently, we found a man uh, uh, in a, a college setting up there, and he started going in and shooting people. He asked him what your faith was. Are you a Christian? And then he shot him. <clears throat> but what is the answer? The answer is that we need to repent and allow God to come into our nation and to restore our nation. We look at the scripture that I read. It says, even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. This generation is following the lesson of replacement. They want God out and they want the devil in. The devil will surely take the place. In fact, we see the results of Satan's deeds and works every day. Jesus said that Satan is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. A murderer and terror is, uh, is from the Lord Satan, who is a Lord of this earth and Lord of many people in this world. And what does the devil bring in? This is why we've seen this influx of things. See, see, as long as God was on the picture and uh, Bible reading was in the schools, then these other uh, 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 vices could not take a hold, it, like homosexuality and all of the things that go along with it. Well, we call it transgender or whatever you want to call it. All of those things were able to come into our society freely once you get God out. So we've replaced God with these other things. How's that working out for us? Not too good, is it? Uh, America needs to repent and turn from their sin and, and, and evict these unclean spirits again. Now let's go back to our scripture at, uh, concerning the unclean spirits. It says here that when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Well, the unclean spirit which is a demonic spirit, which is a fallen angel, which is, a, which is an enemy of God. And he dwells in human beings. They like to dwell in human beings. They occupy areas and places. And they live there freely until somebody comes and evicts them and casts them out. Now, the only one who can cast a demon out is God himself. God has to come along and through somebody's work, God will uh, uh, allow that demon or cast that demon out of that person. We found many places in the scripture where Jesus cast demons out of people and they became normal. And then he said, I will return to my house from whence I came and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. That means cleaned right out. You see, when God comes 
and wipes the demon out of, the, uh, uh, of a person's life, that person is left with a vacancy. He's left with a vacancy. And it's up to that individual. God will never force himself upon any of us. We must invite him to come into our life. We have the power within us to both invite Christ in and invite Christ out. I don't want you in my life, you could say. And when we look at times past and we look at the situation of the, uh, of the uh, uh, people of the Old Testament, and we can start right down the line with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve uh, uh, looked upon the fruit. They were tempted of the devil. And they fell from the grace of God and they fell into sin. And when God uh, uh, approached them, they were pointing fingers at one another. Oh, no, he did it. No, she did it. No, he, she, he, he, he. This, is, this here is pride. This is pride. The Bible says pride cometh before the fall. And it is a prideful thing to want to defend yourself when you're not doing something right. And so you, you have to uh, uh, turn it over to somebody else. The Pharisees in the days of Jesus would have accepted him except for the pride that was in their lives. That we look at it and we say, how could they not have accepted Christ? The miracles that he performed, the, the great messages that he brought. And yet these Pharisees and some of those religious people would not accept Christ. And it was because of the blindness of pride in their life. Cain and Abel is a story of, uh, of uh, uh, two brothers couldn't get along. And it was because of pride that Cain killed his brother Abel. When Moses brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt and uh, they uh, uh, came to a certain point where they wanted to go back to Egypt. It was because of the pride, because of what they had there. They says, we ate good there, now we're over here and all we have is this manna. And so it was because of pride. And we see over and over again that it is pride that keeps us away from God. It is pride that keeps us in that problem that we find here in the book of Matthew. Can you imagine someone whom the demons were cast out of and they will not invite God back into their life because of pride? Because of who I am. No, I, don't. I think I can make it. Thank you, I think I can make it all right on my own. America has evicted God from their schools. And look what happens. Today, if you go to any school system, they have machines in the front of the doors where you go in where they check you for guns and check you for knives and send dogs in to check for drugs. What is going on in the schools? It's because you have taken God out of the schools. And what do you have left? You have to worry about people coming in and trying to shoot you. I remember when I was a kid, I went to one school and we were taking a wood class. And you know what we were, you know what most of the kids were building in wood class? Gun stocks. <laughs> they were making gun stocks in wood class. Can you imagine anyone in a school, uh, uh, in a woodworking class, they want to make a gun stock? A gun stock today? Well, they throw them out of the school. We have one story just recently, a few months ago, of a boy in kindergarten or first grade, a little guy, and he was eating a Pop-Tart. And he was chewing on the Pop-Tart, and he chewed the Pop-Tart into the shape of a gun. And he showed his friends, he says, look what I got. They threw him out of the school for two days for chewing a Pop-Tart into the shape of a gun. you got a crazy school system. A crazy school system. And then we have a, the, the boy, the uh, ninth grader, who took a clock apart and put it in a suitcase, brought it into the school, 
and said, I built a clock. It looked like a bomb. So they arrested him and they threw him out of the school for a few days. You know why we have these problems? Because we have evicted the Prince of Peace. When you take peace out of the school, what do you got left? Nothing but terror. When you take peace out of your life, what have you got left? Nothing but arguments and debating and, and pride, prideful thinking and things happening in your life. As we look at America today, I want to tell you that the things that we have seen, the things that we have seen going on in America are only the beginning it is the end of the drop of the things that are going to be happening in America. When you take God out of this country, and you know this country was founded on the faith of faithful men who loved the Lord and who wrote into the doctrines of our, and the precepts of our Constitution, the idea that there is a God. If you look at some of the great uh, uh, buildings in America, you'll find written on them, one nation under God. Our money has had on it, in God we trust. And yet, now we have atheists and homosexuals and all types of different people coming into our society who want to reign and rule into our society, ungodliness. And we, we seem like we're helpless to the things that are happening. I heard one time not too long ago, they said that 75% of America is made up of Christian people. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that because if 75% of a, this country was, was a, a Christian people, I don't think we would have the problems that we have. But I think that there are many people who call themselves Christians, who say, well, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not a Buddha, I'm not a Muhammad, so I must be a Christian. But Christianity requires you to make a commitment in your life. It requires you to make a stand in your life. It requires you to make a statement and say, I invite Christ in my life. And then Christ and the Holy Spirit will come into your life and they will convict you of the sin in your life and you must repent of that sin. Repent means, the word repent actually means that if you're going in one direction to absolutely turn right around and go in the other direction. So repentance means to turn around. Turn around and go the other way. And a lot of us are not willing to do that. We're not willing to go that other way. We want Christ, but we want to go our own way. It doesn't work out. You're not really following Christ. We sing a song in the church that says, uh, Oh, how I love Jesus. And what a wonderful song it is. But I was always told, and I believe it firmly, that our love is based upon how much we obey the Word of God and love the Word of God. If you don't love the Word of God, then you're singing the song, Oh, how I love Jesus, and you don't really meet it. You know, take like some young people and uh, like this, uh, like uh, Romeo and Juliet, you know? Romeo and Juliet, they loved one another. And they end up uh, uh, committing a suicide over the fact that they couldn't... Uh, they couldn't have their love because of the parents or somebody, you know. But Romeo and Juliet, and we have a lot of Romeo and Juliets today. And uh, they say, I love you, you know. And uh, there's a little story about the fella who's talking to his girlfriend on the phone, and he says, uh, I love you so much, I would, I would, I would, uh, uh, I would uh, cross the greatest sea for you. I'd climb the highest mountain. I would do anything for you and she says oh honey why don't you come over tonight and he says it looks out he says oh it's raining i'll come over tomorrow <laughs> talk is cheap 
Talk is cheap. If we say that we love God, we must produce fruits that show that we love God. If we say we love one another, we have to prove that we love one another. I was on the internet uh, uh, last night and I was talking with a Muslim person from, uh, 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 where was that? Where was he from? He was from Jordan. And, uh, and uh, he, was, he was boasting about his Koran and about all the good things in his Koran. And I asked him a question. I says, does your Koran say that you have to love your neighbor and love your brother? And uh, he says, well, he quoted something from the Quran that says that we have to love pe uh, our neighbors. It was, it was some kind of a offshoot message that, he, not exactly in those words. And I said to him, I says, well, I said, Israel is both your neighbor and your brother. How do you feel about Israel? He says, we got to get rid of them. I says, wait a minute. I thought that you were supposed to love your neighbor and love your brother. We got to get rid of them. They're going to be out in a hurry. And I says, where do you get your information from? Have you heard anything about uh, Iran building a special bomb for Israel or something? Well, how do you know that they're going to be going pretty soon? He says, we will take over Jerusalem. We will, we're going to get Jerusalem back. And this and that and the other. And I says, it doesn't sound very loving to me. It doesn't sound like you love your brother. It sounds like something else. I want to remind everyone how terrible the situation is in the Middle East. And how terrible it is in Egypt. How terrible it is in Iran, in Iraq, Saudi Arabia. Turkey, all of those nations are in disarray and they have poured it out into Europe. Europe is being over flooded with people. Yes, people in great need, but also people who are going there and they're going to cause a lot more trouble in Egypt or in Europe when they get in Europe. <clears throat> now back to America just briefly. As we watch what goes on in our country, I want you to remember these words that Jesus said. That when you empty something out, unless you fill it in right away with something, something else is going to come in there. And we can see the influx into this country of all the evil that has come in when we evict God and take God out. This uh, woman down in Tennessee who refused to put her signature on a paper for marriage between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. And she was thrown into jail over this, you know, thrown into jail because she refused to obey the law. It's, it's kind of a joke to me in a sense that the President of the United States refused to obey the law that was on the books and yet nobody would dare to throw him in jail. And he is the one who really should be thrown in jail. Because he, he is a conspirator and a troublemaker. He is a conspirator and a troublemaker. And, and this, so this woman, you know, she was thrown into jail for her convictions. And she's out of jail now. We're going to pray for her. I think her first name is Kim. Kim Jones or Kim Smith or something. But let's pray for her that God will give her the strength to keep going and not give up on these things. We need, to have, we need to have more people like her who stand up for their convictions. We're living at a, a time when America is going down the tubes, so to speak. And what happens is you take God out, the devil's going to come in, and the devil is going to uh, reign over all the people, not just a few. He'll reign over all the people in America until America repents and turns back to God. And uh, we, we've got a way to go before this all happens. So we'll keep our, uh, keep our eyes on the news. Make sure you watch the news. And uh, I have my two great-grandsons here, and they uh, love to watch the news with their grandpa. 
and uh, one of them there, he, he says, let's go watch the news. And then he, as long as we get a little bit of the Hulk in the, in the story, he's okay with it. He likes to have, uh, you know, he likes to have a little mix up there. But I'm so thankful that God has blessed me and watched over me. And uh, keep your eyes open and be ready to repent at things and uh, watch out for your pride, everybody. Watch out for your pride because your pride is the thing that gets you in trouble when you've got to defend yourself because of your pride. Be careful. Remember when Jesus was uh, brought before Pilate? Uh, and Pilate said, are you the son of God? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? What did Jesus say? He answered him not a word. You know why? Because he, he, he was not proud, prideful at all. He had nothing. He, he could not point to anything and say, well, I'm this and I'm that and I performed this miracle and I did that. He didn't do anything that the father had not instructed him to do. So he was there, and uh, he answered not a word. That's the way that we defeat pride in our life. And sometimes I say, uh, we have to watch out for our verbiage, because it gets us in trouble, okay? <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, again and again for your goodness and mercy. Watch over us, we pray. Keep us in your will and in your way. Watch us, we pray. And Lord, convict us of our sin and keep us, Lord. We pray for our families and our loved ones, for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and our neighbors, all of those around about, Lord. Help us that we might speak to them and help them. And we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. It is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy comfort. Thousand beasts.
side. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. So sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust Him more. <clears throat> oh, Jesus is the only way. He's the only name you'll hear on that day. What price will you bring when you stand before Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. And he walked upon the water one sweet day. He healed the blind and Calvary, Jesus. 